Now, I understand Christmas was almost two weeks ago. Can you believe it? Almost two weeks ago. But let me ask you a question. How many of y'all either got or gave a present today? And in particular, is there anybody here this morning trying to figure out what to do with 12 drummers drumming, 11 pipers piping, 10 lords a leaping, 9 ladies dancing, 8 maids a milking, 7 swans a swimming, 6 geese a laying, what? 5 golden rings, 4 calling birds, 3 French hands, 2 turtle doves, and of course, a partridge in a pear tree. How many of y'all are trying to figure out where you're going to put that in the house? And if you are, if that's a problem you have today, would you mind telling me who gave you all that stuff? You see, according to an article I read in Forbes, Forbes magazine yesterday, these gifts, if you bought them all together, would run a person $39,094.93. That is, if you could even find 10 lords who are willing to leap. And I've got to tell you, anybody with that much disposable income, man, I want to give that person a stewardship card. But you know, this business about milking maids and calling birds, well, it's actually appropriate to talk about this stuff. Because today is Epiphany, which is the 12th day. And on this day, the church has traditionally focused on the coming of the Magi, you know, the wise men. We three kings of Orion are. And so that's going to be our focus this morning. And even though y'all will never see him in anybody's nativity, there was another person involved here, another king. And I'm talking about King Herod. And since the Magi and Herod are sort of intertwined in the story, we're going to consider them together. And so first, we'll focus on how Matthew described what happened. And then second, we'll take this account and apply it to our lives. And to understand the coming of the Magi, when well, we've got to look at the Gospel of Matthew. We don't have any other choice because it's found nowhere else. You see, while Luke focused on Mary and Joseph traveling from Bethlehem or from Nazareth to Bethlehem and how Jesus was born in a stable because there was no room for him in the end, when Matthew told the same story, and I'm talking about the birth story, he didn't say anything about mangers. He didn't say anything about shepherds. And he didn't say anything about angelic choirs. Instead, he offered the story of the Magi coming to worship Christ. And even though we tend to blend Matthew and Luke together, we tend to make them one story, if we resist this temptation and let them be separate, each one has its own meaning and application. But you know, I think it's interesting, the amount of space Matthew spent talking about the kings in Egypt, well, it was a whole lot less than what he had to say about that other king. And again, I'm talking about Herod. I mean, just consider what he wrote. Of course, before doing anything else, Matthew was a good writer. Therefore, he established the situation. When Jesus was born in the village of Bethlehem in Judea, Herod was king. During this time, some wise men from the east came to Jerusalem and said, Where is the child born to be king of the Jews? We saw the star in the east and have come to worship him. And so not only was the scene established the main characters were introduced. Jesus, Herod, and the wise men, right? But you know, as soon as he did this, he immediately shifted gear away from the Magi. He wrote, when King Herod heard about this, he was worried, and so was everyone else in Jerusalem. Herod brought together the chief priests and the teachers of the law of Moses and asked them, where will the Messiah be born? They told him he will be born in Bethlehem, just as the prophet wrote, Bethlehem in the land of Judea, you are very important among the towns of Judea. From your town will come a leader who will be a shepherd for my people Israel. You see, right here, Matthew put Herod in the spotlight. He put him right at the center of his story. And even though he returned to the wise men and they're coming to Jesus, for Matthew, Herod was still involved. 
He wrote, Herod secretly called in the wise men and asked them when they had first seen the star. He told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, let me know. I want to go and worship him too. The wise men listened to what the king said and then left. And the star they had seen in the east went on ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. They were thrilled and excited to see the star. When the men went into the house and saw the child, his mother, and with Mary, his mother, they knelt down and worshipped him. They took their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh and gave them to him. Later they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod, and they went back home by another road. You see, even as he described the adoration of the Magi, you know, the wise men, he wrote and wrote about the gifts they'd given to Jesus. Matthew mentioned Herod at both the beginning and the end. He becomes sort of like bookends to this account. In other words, at the very least, this Lion King shared equal billing with the wise men. But it didn't take us long to find out that Herod was worse than just a liar. Matthew continued, After the wise men had gone, an angel from the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, hurry, take the child and his mother to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is looking for the child and wants to kill him. That night, Joseph got up and took his wife and the child to Egypt, where they stayed until Herod died. So the Lord's promise came true, just as the prophet had said, I called my son out of Egypt. And just to show that the angel, angel's warning was right on the mark, and just how terrible this king was, Matthew wrote this, when Herod found out that the wise man, men from the east had tricked him, he was very angry. He gave orders for his men to kill all the boys who lived in or near Bethlehem and were two years old and younger. This was based on what he had learned from the wise men. So the Lord's promise came true, just as the prophet Jeremiah had said. In Ramah, a voice was heard crying and weeping loudly. Rachel was mourning for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were dead. And so we've got this jealous, this pitiful excuse for a king out and out lying to the Magi about his interest in Jesus. But then when he found out he'd been tricked, we got him deciding to kill all the boys, two years old and younger, who had been born in and around Bethlehem. Now, in case you're wondering, this story is called the Massacre of the Innocents because that is exactly what happened. And to make it even worse, this wasn't even out of character for Herod. Given the fact that during his reign, he killed one of his wives, his brother-in-law, three of his own sons, and 300 military leaders. Now, that was Herod. And somehow I think it's doubtful he'll ever break into anybody's Christmas story. But I'll tell you, even though I think that's appropriate, he really doesn't belong standing there at the manger. As we tie up this series... I think it's appropriate that we keep Herod right where he belongs. Because among other things, I believe Matthew is offering us a pretty accurate description of the kind of lives we can expect as Christians. Let me explain what I'm talking about. You see, on one hand, when we decide to respond to God's unconditional love for us by trusting in his Son, I think we're going to share in the same kind of glory represented by those wise men. You know, when they followed the star to Jesus, a, a glory that I believe is represented in the three gifts they brought. I mean, not only were they drawn to Christ by that star, just like we've been drawn by the Holy Spirit, the gold and the frankincense and myrrh really tell us who Jesus was and exactly what he came to do. For example, just think about the gold. Just think about the gold. Of course, that's something that's obviously of enormous value. The sort of stuff the king seek and have. And I think that reminds us of Jesus' authority. You know, his power. You see, he truly is our Lord and king. But that wasn't the only gift brought. Because the Magi also presented something called frankincense. And frankincense was this resin that was used to make incense, you know, for worship. 
In fact, it was mentioned in the book of Leviticus. When anyone presents a grain offering to the Lord, the offering shall be of choice flour, and the worshiper shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it and bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests. After taking from it a handful of choice flour and oil with all its frankincense, the priest shall turn this token portion into smoke on the altar, an offering by fire of pleasing odor to the Lord. Now that's frankincense. Something that points to the holiness, to the, the godliness, to the priesthood of Jesus. And then there's myrrh. Without a doubt, the oddest gift anyone could give to a baby. I mean, it's something you wouldn't bring to a baby shower. You see, although incredibly valuable, myrrh was associated with embalming, therefore with death. As a matter of fact, it's going to actually play a part in the crucifixion later in the life of Jesus. You see, according to Mark, then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh. But he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each would take. You see, the one who received gold like a king and who received frankincense like a priest, this one also re was given myrrh, something that points us towards a savior. You know, the one who died on the cross in order to free us from our sins. And I'll tell you, this is the glory that surrounds the coming of the Magi, a glory that we can experience the minute we decide to trust. And that's what we have on one hand. But that's only half of the story. Because on the other hand, we also have Herod. A figure that reminds us that living the Christian life, you know, the denying self and taking up the cross and following Jesus isn't just about glory. You see, because Herod was also there in the story, in a way casting a shadow over the Magi and their gifts. Well, for me, that's a reminder that Christians still face plenty of challenges living in the real world. The world that we have and not the one that we want. For example, as this story shows us, evil is certainly present in our world. It was then and is now. Therefore, it's a reality that we have to face. My goodness, anyone who knows history or follows current events knows that there are plenty of folks who are motivated by jealousy and by pride. Individuals who lie all the time to get what they want and who are willing to crush anyone who gets in their way. People who do horrible things to one another and who then justify it by appealing to our fears and our intolerance. And let me be clear, this reality isn't the property only of men and women who have great earthly power and wealth. I'm not talking about them, just them. Although they may be able to do the most damage, I think we see this same kind of attitude in our families and in our communities and even in our churches. And sadly for us, their hatred and violence, their jealousy and envy is often directed against those who are trying to follow Jesus as best they can. And I'll tell you, I think Jesus himself knew that this sort of thing was going to happen. And that's why he held no punches when he said, God will bless you when people insult you, mistreat you, and tell all kinds of evil lies about you because of me. Be happy and excited. You will have a great reward in heaven. People did the same things to the prophets who lived long ago. And later he warned his disciples saying, don't think that I came to bring peace to the earth. I came to bring trouble, not peace. I came to turn sons against their fathers, daughters against their mothers, daughter-in-laws against their mother-in-laws. Your worst enemies will be in your own family. No, we live in a hard and often cruel world. But you know, even though that's the case, and we all know it, we also need to remember that we're not alone. Just like the angel warned Joseph of Herod, God is always with us. In fact, that's exactly what Jesus came to be. He was our Emmanuel, 
which means in Hebrew, God with us. And he reiterated that truth in the last words he spoke to his disciples. Jesus came to them and said, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go to the people of all nations and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teach them to do everything I have told you. I will be with you always, even until the end of the world. You see, in spite of everything we might encounter, in spite of all the herods that are thrown in our way, we are never alone. Our loving God is always with us. And since that's the case, we can choose to work together as the body of Christ and confront all the evil that's out there. The lies and the hatred and the jealousy. And we can do it by standing up for what is right. And that's one way I think we can apply this story. And now we're done with this series. I mean, during this Christmas season, we looked at those who are connected with the birth. I mean, we talked about Zachariah and Elizabeth and how they anticipated the one who was coming. And we looked at their son, John the Baptist, and his challenge to be prepared. And we considered the faith of both Mary and Joseph and how their trust became part of the birth story. And this morning we focused on how the glory of the Magi and the pain inflicted by Herod shows us exactly what we can expect as followers of Jesus Christ. Now that's what we did during these four messages. You see, we've met the people and we've heard their stories. But you know, we still have a decision to make. And I'm talking about whether or not to apply the lessons they offer to our own lives. Amen.